Welcome back once again to Kevin Pollack's chat show, everyone. I've spoken of myself uh, for the 186th time that you know of in third person. Um, we're coming to you today, a uh, beautiful, gorgeous, sunny day here, October 20th in the, uh, in the Culver City area. Um, we have our first repeat guest today in 186 shows, and I'm unbelievably excited. And he, there, I've given away too much already. I no doubt feels honored. Uh, Sammy, tell us about your night. You know about my night. You were there for most of it. We went to uh, the Santa Monica Pier yesterday. We'd spent uh, much of the day on our feet, drunk. <laughs> Watching uh, amazing comedy and music. We saw a rare drunk Sam Levine. He had four beers. Ish, drunkish. Drunk drunk like yeah, he was in his cups. They would those, say. Uh, those were large you beers. Have, you should have not sucked on that milkshake. I never should have had that milkshake. <laughs> that the couldn't have sat well. There's that did not. Yeah. No, there I made a lot of food and beverage mistakes yesterday. <laughs> what were the food mistakes? Because we didn't see much food. Other than the milkshake, it was really the lack of food yeah. Yeah. that, that did me in. Who was your favorite? What was your favorite comedic moment of the Jack Black uh, uh, organized this entire festival mm -hmm. called Festival Supreme? And um, it was on the Santa Monica Pier. There were three tents. Yeah. Who so was your, many acts. What was your fa favorite? Uh, uh, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna say my favorite act that I saw yesterday was Zach Galifianakis because, my own personal uh, opinion, I like comedians who stand up and tell comedy. I also like uh, musicians, and I've seen lots of very funny musical acts. Uh, like but Tenacious I, D. Like Tenacious D. Like Garfunkel and Oates, and I enjoy those very much. But my my heart is always with uh, true standups. And that was the tough thing. It was hard to get to, to see like the true standups because they were all in that really small tent that, yeah. that was uh, like was always at capacity. It was hard to get back there. And the giant so we tent uh, gave way to comedians and sketch actors who suddenly have a band that's supposed to be ironic. It isn't. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that was now. interesting. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. And by interesting, of course, I mean the opposite of that. Mm. Uh, yeah, but um, Triumph, I think, was my favorite. Triumph had a Triumph tre tremendous show. Yeah, because he, you know, listen, it's always funny. It's the same joke, but he finds a way to be the m most insane. He just went after the crowd and the ho like, and, 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 and Jack and Kyle was amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. If I may, they're so fat that D in Tenacious D now stands for, for diabetes. diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> it really was great. And what did he say about the guy's eyes in the audience were so red? He, oh boy, that was a great No, what was that? The yeah. song was originally, uh, the song is now in B flat because Jack Black sat on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm singing the song in B flat. And he kept doing rim shots. It was originally in B. Wow. But Jack Black sat. And he kept doing rim shots. Yeah. Yeah, it oh really was beautiful. And Conan came out and did a bit with Triumph. It yeah. was fantastic. There's a lot of surprises. And Sandler sang with his band yeah. five or six songs that brought you, and that kids, was, brought you kids back to your... Uh, I think that was something like the first time he's done that since like the 90s, something crazy. Yeah, <gasps> yeah. It really was. It really was actually kind of great. You guys remember the nineties? Um, I remember the in last theory. night. I remember the nineties. I kept theory. saying that during Triumph and and uh, Sandler, I kept going, hey, "Guys, remember the nineties? <laughs> <laughs> it's on stage right now." Um, I was just reminded by my phone to put my phone on uh, airplane mode for anyone else who might need that. Um, are you watching us live on the YouTube? We're coming to you so very early today, which uh, we're going to, uh, to talk to our guests right now about. Um, but to pick, pick us up on the Earwolf afterwards, perhaps that's how you're hearing us. Let us know is the point I'm getting at. Write to us at contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, there could be cash prizes involved. A lot of you just listen to the show. You don't watch it. So you didn't, uh, you didn't have to sit through that last joke. <laughs> you, you didn't see the legal nodding of the head that there would be no cash prizes. Yeah, that was for, for, for the legal purposes. The legal team of Jew, Jew, and Jewish. Um, how about Jim Rash next Sunday and uh, Lynn, Lynn Levine? Levine. Sweet Jim Lynn Rash Levine. will be our guest, who will be our eighth Academy Award winner. Uh, and, um, and your mother, Lynn Levine. Who will be our first Tony Award watcher. <laughs> nice! Thank you. Way to bring it home. Because I had nowhere to go with the fact that other than your mother was coming to the show. Um, all right, my guest today is an old dear friend, and by that I mean we're both old. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and here. <laughs> Please welcome back the Greg Proops. Hello, sir. Hello, Kevin. How are you, buddy boy? I'm good, man. Um, all right, so this is a very special event for us. As I said, you're our first return guest, 186 no shows. And, and how does that feel? First of all, just fishing for any sort of compliment. I think it's tremendous. I didn't know <laughs> that you had been able to consistently book without repeating. It seems like 
most podcasts keep having the same comics on over and over again. So it's I, uh, the new L.A. jury duty. Oh, absolutely. You get a notice and you're like, really, this yellow piece of paper? This is complicated. <laughs> yeah. When do I phone in? How do I know I'm going? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, your own damn uh, poop cast. <laughs> Now, you started with a live on stage chat show of your own at uh, Largo. I did. For many years. How much fun was that to do? It was really fun. Um, I was never going to get a TV show off the back of it. I basically did it just because I thought it was fun. Right. Uh, John Bryan was off in the band. But I also had on uh, uh, Colin Hay and Grant Lee Phillips and, uh, you know, like a mad amount of great musicians and loads and loads of comedians and actors. And the best part of that was. As you know, when you have good people, you don't have to tell them what to do or have a meeting. Yeah. And so we never had meetings and I never told anyone what to do and everybody killed. Yeah. Uh, so to me, it was, I, I think I put Russell Brand on probably up in LA before anyone else did. I remember someone phoned me and went, Russell wants to know where's a hit place to do a set. And I went, my show. Yeah. So I had him on my show. So it's you I have to thank. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say I made his career help him in any way. He played an obscure club on Fairfax Avenue. Oh, let's be clear. Yeah, on a, on a Tuesday night. Right. Um, I enjoy the subtlety of his act. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's um, talk about the. We, we made fun of uh, podcasts in general. But uh, tell me about your uh, discovery, and uh, you've been doing your own now for quite some time, too. You were one of the uh, forefathers, or, or damn near. Well, I got in about two and a half. 2010 is when we started. What does that make it? Oh, crikey. I know. I think we're on our third year here. <laughs> uh, but the truth is, we only started about four and a half years ago. Uh, shortly after us, Marin started. Uh, but, but the thing with Marin is he'll do three, four in a week. Oh, yeah. So whereas we're doing 186 here, he, I think he's on 480. Oh, sure, sure. How often That's do you... a lot of whining. Oof. Yeah. That's how a lot, often, how a lot often, of cats. How often do you do yours? I do mine at least once a week. Right. Sometimes I'll do it two or three times in a week, but we only release one a week. And at first we were putting them out on Fridays, and then it determined after, oh, I don't know, two years that Monday was better. Yeah. Because people are going to work and have a week to start and stuff like that. And right. don't live in the same world that we do where there is no weekend ever. <laughs> uh, right. So, yeah. No, it's been, it's been everything to me. I mean, it's the most fun I've ever had in comedy. Right. And that's after doing comedy for over 400 years. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, 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 because I get to say what I want and do what I want, and it's from the heart. And everything that anyone would have ever told you in a meeting is, of course, wrong. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I think the big payoff is. Uh, one, it's, uh, it's us taking back the means of production and spending our own money. And uh, two, uh, uh, the more honest I am and the more I get into my own politics and opinions, the more people respond to it, which you would have been told not to do. Well, on stage, it's rule number six, I think, mm. which is just know when you go political, you're going to alienate half the audience. Right. So what's the point? Everyone paid to see you. Why not go ahead and invite them all in? Um, and you do them live on stage sometimes, but but mostly, where, where do you where do you do it? I do them live on stage all the time. I've only done maybe one or two oh. in, in the studio oh, because awesome. I want the live crowd. Right, they're my guests because right. I don't have guests on the show because my ego prohibits it. Sure. And uh, also, everyone else had guests, so I figured, why not do something everyone else isn't doing? Yeah, and 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 you know, it, at this point. Uh, we joke about the ridiculous number of podcasts. Why not separate yourself from the pack in every possible way you can? Well, I thought it would be... Uh, at first, I thought, well, let's have authors on or something. And then, of course, mm, you know... Because <laughs> they're hilarious. I was going to say, <laughs> what if that doesn't really fly? Uh, and then there's the whole book thing, because people don't really read anymore. So, right. uh, um, so how is it different than a live stand-up set every Because episode? I sit and I drink and I have my newspapers and my you know, computer readouts and all my junk and I have the Constitution with me and sometimes the Bible and whatever and right. I'll read from those things and I read from different stuff and I do funny voices and you know you were talking about playing music. Uh, someone asked me a couple weeks ago and then I take questions from the audience and someone got up and went, if you had a dream band, what would your band be and what would you do and this and that? And I went, I don't need a dream band. I sing all I want on this podcast. I'm like, I am my dream band. Yeah. Uh, and, and then having the audience respond to me has been the best part because I go out and meet everyone in the crowd before the show, which I would never do at a stand-up show. I think it queers the magic of a stand-up show. Sure. You have to appear in front of them and then do your incantation. Yeah. Uh, whereas with the podcast, I talk to everybody before the show, then I sit down, and it's as if we've already started. Wow. So there's a different atmosphere. And that's Did that the notion I, just come to you? Because that's kind of brilliant. And you're right, it's so air alien to a stand-up comedian yeah. to even contemplate that. You'd never do it. I mean, I would never do it. Maybe after you'd say hi, but... 
Did someone suggest it, or you just have a no, mini, mini epiphany? Yeah, I started working the crowd before the show. I thought, I'm just going to walk into the crowd and shake hands with everybody person there. Right. And then I do it in London a lot, and you know, English people are a little shy, and Canadians are too. Right. And English people aren't ready at all to have the performer come up and I'll go, hi. And some of them are, look at me like this and I'll go, it's part of the punishment, you have to meet me. <laughs> uh, and then afterward they'll tweet, oh, it's very nice, he came up and he spoke to us before. And you're like, yeah, because no one would ever speak to you in England unless you know, you've been introduced by you know, the queen. Uh, right. So I, I think that's been the best part, because the connection is way Way more intense, I think. I get uh, people respond to little things that you forgot you said in the middle of the show. All of a sudden, that's an issue. So you have to be a little more circumspect about the kind of libelous nonsense that you spout. Well, yes. Uh, and occasionally, I'll take things out that I've said that are just straight up defamatory, you know, or too horrible to even imagine. Uh, let's talk about that, because you just touched on <laughs> something I hadn't really thought of, and we haven't discussed at all on this show with the 4,700 people we've had here that do their own podcasts. Is editing your own shit. Mm. You know, uh, you have a new special coming out, which we're going to talk about, of course. And and it, when you're in that editing bay, editing your stand-up is one thing. But editing, a, a, you know, a conversation, uh, I, I do this other podcast, Talk and Walk, and it's just me rambling as Christopher Walken in a conversation with someone. And so that's the one I edit at home mm -hmm. on, uh, on the, the, uh, the garage band. On your reel to reel, <laughs> <laughs> on your steam powered. Yeah, yeah. It seems so archaic already, Garage Man. Yeah. Right? It seems like something from the forties. Yeah. But uh, uh, Kenny's over there judging you, like, oh, there's better programs you can use. Yeah, I much better. I still have not an avid. <laughs> yeah, there's nineteen. I got like cold dead hands. <laughs> but it, there's something about playing a conversation or just any sort of live. Um, audio track. That's something I'd never done before, is to edit a live audio track. Um, and and this sort of rewrite opportunity that, mm. that I've never thought of in terms of, of stand-up before. Yeah, so that must be a weekly fun thing for you. Well, I, I let uh, my producers do all of the, I'll give. I'll write down, take this part out. Or I said something straight up about someone a couple of weeks ago, a famous person that they had slept with another famous person because another famous person had said it to me. And my wife heard the show and went, really? <laughs> so we're going to get sued and that's okay with you? And I was like, mm, maybe we won't. And so I had them kind of tweak that part. Yeah. But I just send them notes. And when I ever did uh, stand-up albums, I always let the producers edit the album because I wanted an objective th uh, outside ear, you know, because I feel like... You know, with stand-up, you're like, these are my babies. Yeah. Don't touch them. Don't, don't look at them. Don't shake them. You'll kill them. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I kind of feel like sometimes it's better to have someone else listen to it and go, that part actually wasn't that funny. You need to cut that out, whereas you'll be defending it to the death. You yeah. Know? Well, you're just making me realize, I think in the three comedy albums I allegedly put out, I don't think I, think I edited them at all. I just recorded the set yeah. and put it out. But I don't think it's our job to always edit everything we say. I think that's what... Well, I wanted it to be for. a real live experience yeah, yeah, of what yeah. the fuck happened. Yeah. Yeah, although the stand-up specials are, are the same as well. Tell me about editing this new special. What was that like for well, you? Did you just give notes again to producers? I, 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 I let them edit it. Uh, Neil Marshall uh, produced it, um, who did all of Carlin's uh, specials, so I kind of felt like he was in... Great hands. Yeah. And also, hilariously, you know, uh, he's worked with Carlin for 100 years. Right. Carlin's the most meticulous comedian that ever lived. Every semicolon, every punctuation mark, every pause, every turn of the head is a choreographed, because he didn't improvise. And I saw him once, years ago at the Comedy Store, and he hadn't finished the special yet. And he goes, I'm, I haven't memorized this part. Took out a piece of paper and read it, and it was just as funny, because he writes in his voice perfectly, right? And he, and he said to the crowd, I don't improvise, I memorize. And I'm exactly the opposite. I have an idea of what I'm going to do, and then I'll you know, start spinning and wheedling and dissembling, and hopefully something funny happens. So he's asking me like two weeks before, let me see the set. You know, I'm like, sure. <laughs> And I'd just do something, and he'd be Penguins. like, is that, yeah, Peanut is butter. that what you're going to do? And then I invited him to the podcast a couple times, and he'd hilariously show up at the podcast, and it would be like in a bar, in a room, there'd be people there, and he'd go, so who's opening? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, me, and I'll, I'll be closing too. Uh, and then I found we had a meeting right before we shot the, uh, the fucker, and uh, I... Uh, I had pulled some quotes because we did it at Musso and Frank, right? And because all the writers hung out at Musso and Frank. Faulkner, 
Hemingway, uh, Bukowski, John Fawney, you know, Chandler wrote The Big Sleep there, all that. So I pulled this awesome quote from Faulkner where he said, time is dead as long as it's being clicked off by little wheels. Only when the clock stops does time begin. And I said, this is Monsieur and Frank's where the clock stops. And Neil went, brilliant, like that. And I went, got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, then I thought, oh my God. Because on the day, I had some of it you know, down, and some of it's made up on the day. And yeah. I pulled in things from other bits that I had no intention of doing until I got in front of that crowd, and we had no retakes. Wow. Did I did it all in one go. When you were on stage, uh, that one go in one opportunity, did it cross your mind that Moose on Franks was the original Starbucks where writers like now Diablo Cody Yes. Right, award-winning screenplay. I said, the, the, it, no, no one ordered juice. <laughs> there was no such thing as a smoothie. If Robert Mitchum ordered a smoothie, it had bourbon in it. Or even coffee. They, yeah, they weren't said, even faking that. No, said, Robert, Robert Mitchum used to drink at Musa's, and he was so cool that his house was the medical marijuana dispensary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the whole idea of, like, uh, that restaurants that serve quinoa and kale and goji berries and ramp <laughs> And then we're at a place that still serves stuffed celery <laughs> and Welsh, Welsh rarebit. And, uh, and like, uh, you know, so I talked about their menu, you know, like I go, when was the last time you had stuffed celery? And you hear that crunching noise and uh, what is it? Oh, my God, did I break my arm? No, that was the portal to a new universe opening. Because <laughs> <laughs> nice. a lot of people have never even had stuffed celery. They're not <clears throat> of our vintage. Yeah. And they don't remember what it was. Yeah. And they've never been offered it. Uh, but I love the old schoolness of it. And uh, so... Yeah, a lot of things ran through my mind as I was standing up there. The fact that I hadn't eaten quite enough, that I'd had a martini, you know, uh, <laughs> that I was clinging to reality, that I was tanned within an inch of my life, you know, the, the things that go through your mind. Yeah. Uh, now, how did, it, how did it even come into your mind to, to shoot the special at Musa? Well, it was my manager's idea. For those idea. who don't know, uh, it's a, a restaurant. Uh, yeah. So your manager. Well, it's the oldest restaurant in Hollywood, which means 1919, because <laughs> as you know, Hollywood yesterday is shrouded in the mists of time. Uh, and three weeks ago, you know, uh, John and Kate plus eight was something. Uh, so, you know, things move very quickly here. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 Chaplin ate there. Uh, if you sit in the booth next to the window there, that was Chaplin's booth that was open to the street in those days, and he would kibitz and argue with the original Musso over whether he should pay for lunch every day. Because wow. he'd be like, I'm bringing people in, and Musso would go like, pay your goddamn check. And he'd be like, I'm the biggest star in the world. Uh, so it has all that history. My manager went there for an event with a munchkin. I think they were celebrating a munchkin's birthday or something. Sure. And fantastically, he said, the munchkin says he's 91, but he's 93, which I love. <laughs> 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 Fuck you, man. <laughs> it never ends. Fuck you, asshole. Yeah. 91. 91, you cocksuckers. <laughs> and, uh, he said he's 91. <laughs> um, the, uh, so, 94. Fuck you. And your little dog, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he called me the next day because we've been looking for a place. And right. I've been taken to like. You know, little improv theaters here and there, and you know, LA's full of little theaters. Yeah. And after the third or fourth one, my wife was like, This is bullshit. And I was like, I don't know what to do, you know? Yeah. And he called me and he goes, I've got it, Moose House. And we went down, we had lunch with the owner. He said, I'd love to. So in the back room there, there's the front room with the red booths, then there's the back room with the other booths, and there's the beautiful bar. And we just cleared some tables out, put me in the corner, and put a little jazz combo behind me. Dear God. Yep. Fantastic. It was really good fun. And it fits in with my motif of I'm a kind of, I don't know, I would say I was nostalgic. I'd like to consider it more classic. Yeah. Uh, I do like to talk about books and movies and but things like that. But there's a tour. There's yeah, a, you yeah. know, the smartest man in the world feel to it. And the whole martinis in the daytime thing. I mean, that, yeah. was, uh, that was a big part of it. Because one of the quotes I also used was Bukowski who said, never get up before noon. <laughs> Which, of course, we haven't been able to do in 100 years, but it's a great thing to say. Yeah, and, uh, thanks for uh, bringing us all in here this morning at 10.30. <laughs> well, he's dead. I'm in the makeup chair at 20 to noon, and Samantha Ward, our wonderful makeup artist, says, it's really not that early. <laughs> yeah. Well, 20 to noon. It is if you live at night. <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're up when the uh, paper boy drops the paper off and you haven't been to sleep yet. Uh, remember when there was Look, a paper I know this boy? is all because of the neighbors and their party, and they didn't tell you. Oh, yeah. We excited. had this last night. We we <laughs> we pull up last night, and the neighbors next door, who are, what do we think? We're trying to figure it out. Did they move in the beginning of the summer? Yes. So the house, uh, when we moved in, the Thanksgiving will be four years. Uh, 
a 90-something-year-old woman lived there yeah. with, with help, care, and we never saw her, never heard a word. So for the first two and a half, three years, we had an empty house next door yeah. for the most part. She passed away, and uh, <laughs> they leased it to this couple with a, a small child, or so it appears mm -hmm. to be. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's a dog. It's on a need-to-care basis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly yeah. a munchkin. Yeah. It could be a dog in pain. It's pants. that 91-year-old munchkin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not a child. <laughs> <laughs> right. Smoking a cigar in the baby yeah, carriage. Yeah, yeah. I like the bouncy, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, so, it, I guess it speaks volumes about me that I, I don't go next door with a basket and say, welcome to the neighborhood, right. but in fact build a, a thicker wall. And um, we come home last night and there are, I don't know, 74 little bags with candles in them mm -hmm. leading up to the door. Not a single one filled with uh, feces until I left. <laughs> right, no burning feces until mm -hmm. Sam left. It's poop again. But it's clearly a party going on. And then our <laughs> back deck, and their back area uh, is, are visible to each other, even though there are some walls and what have you. And suddenly there's a, a, a wonderful party in the backyard, and my first thought is, these assholes should have given us a heads up. Mm -hmm. And then it dawned on me, well, how many parties have we thrown since they moved in and we never, and then we, the argument. That would be all of them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then the arguments began. Our parties weren't as big as this one apparently is. And, Did they uh, stay up all night playing their loud music? That then, was the thing. We went to, it didn't even affect us. We went to bed. It we was like so we didn't even. Tired. Right, right. We were so fucking well, tired. Well, you've been day drinking yeah. in the hot sun. Yeah. Well, well in a hot tent. Yeah. Both. And uh, that was the irony. We were mad, mad, mad until we fell asleep mm -hmm. at 12.01. Were, were, they playing the, were they playing the jungle music? <laughs> <laughs> that, that incites the teens to sexual acts? The STD music? No, they, they were... Um, <laughs> They were a happy-go-lucky churchgoers, as well, far as we could tell. Also, oh, yeah, if like, I may say, your parties are superior to theirs because your parties have uh, members of the Murray family at them. <laughs> yes, that's right. Aww. That's, that's the all lovely same. Brian Doyle Murray. Our neighbor. Bless him. Um, now, let's get to the, um, to the wonderful part of the uh, conversation. Okay. Which is something that you uh, unfortunately had to share as you were sitting down. Um, best laid plans would be the category. Um, so you've got Musso and Frank, you've got the, this historical landmark, uh, the, the originality that goes with that is fucking spectacular. The show is uh, uh, to your liking and editing takes place and you've already shopped it around, you know what you're going to do with it in terms of distribution. Because now, of course, myriad opportunities. Do you self-distribute? You know, not everyone is, can do Louis C.K. I notice even An Ansari tried, and his I think was not at all a success. Right, the model is not actually all the way built, as, no. as we say here in Hollywood. I think it's just for the biggest act in the world, Pretty much. and then otherwise. So, what what opportunities uh, did you contemplate? Where did you end up, and how wonderful is that going? Well, we went to Chill.com, uh, who Maria Bamford had quite a good special with earlier uh, last year, and uh, Ari Shafir, and several other comics. And then uh, uh, we're and supposed to... what are they, Chill.com? Chill.com is a, a platform that um, they put the videos on, and that's where you go and you buy the, uh, uh, and download the video. So that was our plan. Uh, we have a deal with them. They produced the video. They gave me the money to produce it. And uh, then we were supposed to drop it on October 22nd, Tuesday. And I got a call Friday, and it was in all the trades that Chill.com has ceased to exist as, a, as an entity. Uh, so now I have a video, and I have some people who have probably pre-ordered the video, who either they get their $5 back, or I go to their house and act the video out for them with right. stick figures. And Where should I sit? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's what happened. It was a, 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 I was completely blindsided, as I'm sure Chill must have been. Uh, and so now we're looking for... Uh, the dazzling myriad of opportunities that is coming toward us here. That's exactly right. Well, they, One you know, door has closed and another thousand doors have opened. Yeah, and did anyone, uh, who I'm sure were on a, uh, a wonderfully happy uh, staff of people running chill.com, whose jobs were yanked out beneath them. Oh, they all lost their jobs. Yeah. yeah, I think there's like five people there, and they're probably open for another month or something. Did anyone over there give you a heads up, or did it just come from the Oh, no. No, why would they? Oh, no, no, That'd no. be a wonderful conversation to have. No, no one did that. Uh, I mean, you Your know. people you, called you. You've been on enough uh, 
TV shows that got canceled or projects that got axed at the last minute, or even that you were just personally fired from. Yeah, the fun, all of these things have happened yeah, to us. Yeah, the most enjoyable part is during rehearsal mm -hmm. on the sound stage. Yeah. Uh, guys, can we just come over for a moment? Yeah. That's never good. No, that's always a bad one. I, I've been uh, fired, let go, told things, but, and no one ever, ever, ever phones you in my experience. One, one person uh, has in my lifetime. A producer's been very kind about that. Uh, no, my manager called me. First, I, of course, saw it on the internet, and then uh, I immediately a phone call. And, Nikki uh, Fink? <laughs> if only Nikki Fink. This is the, this is an internet entity about the internet, so it was on like you know, internet.com says. Uh, it was some internet site about internet entities. And sure. Now it's all over the place. And my manager goes, I don't want you to announce it. I'm like, it's a little late. The kitten's already out of the bag and been hit in the middle of the road and is lying there eviscerated, and people are driving by and taking photos. Uh, so uh, putting them back on the online. Exactly, and then Instagramming them to me. Um, so I'm announcing to everybody, basically right now. It's Today, that if you did pre say uh, pre buy it, uh, something will happen. Either you'll get it or you'll get a refund, and that somehow this video will come out. But I can't tell you how because of the magic of the media. Mm. Uh, it'll end up either on TV or back on another site where we sell it again or right. something. Well, there are so many uh, uh, portals now available. Yes, there are. And, and whereas that one sounded good at one point, probably from Maria's success as well, it makes a great deal of sense. Um, yeah, I would think the word myriad should be bantied about. There's just too many different ways to go here. And also, I, I enjoy uh, uh, something of a following in different countries. So for me, it wasn't a matter of like, oh, it's not going to go out in L.A. Because L.A. is, although always relevant, is not the most relevant part of, uh, as we say in Hollywood, my business. Right. Uh, my business is in Ireland. My business is in England, Canada. Australia, whatever. So I want them to be able to see it too, which is why the internet way of delivering it was the perfect way. Yeah. Because if we go to TV again now, then that it's a longer process for it to get to those places. Because right. I'll have to sell it to each market and stuff like that. So we'll see what will happen. I'm hoping magic strikes in the next week and that some kindly Hebrew person takes pity on me and and uh, and likes my show. I'm also hoping that whoever watches it is around our age and knows what Musos is. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's not exactly a Comedy Central fake. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You go to, hey, it's from the oldest restaurant in Hollywood. Watch this sweating middle-aged man talk about a drug story from the 70s for an hour. Uh, what kid doesn't want that? Although the truth is, as you know, because you have a podcast, um, I have loads of young uh, everyone who listens to podcasts tends to be. Uh, all, oh, yeah. I, get, I get all ages, and most, we welcome all ages. Most people and are most age. faiths. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I think I already have. I have kids write me and go, "I, I never heard of the Ohio Players." What the or, fuck are you talking right, about? Right, or I never heard of Gil Scott Heron, or I've never heard of Willie Mays and all the stuff I talk about, or Humphrey Bogart, and then they watch this stuff and listen to it. So I feel like, in a way, I'm my own crappy history professor <laughs> teaching my own ad hoc course. Crappy or reinvention? Mm. Mm -hmm. Can I make a suggestion? Please. Uh, next special, do it from the second oldest restaurant in Hollywood, yes. the Chipotle on Vine. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why you have a Sam Levine. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the, the Arby's right near the Scientology <laughs> the uh, Psychology Museum of Death or whatever. <laughs> that, that always is a great location. <laughs> I think I've been to that Arby's. Yeah. Um, the Chipotle. Yeah. Uh, well, do you have a, a system to reach all of your podcast fans in, in a moment? I mean, if they're not all following you on Twitter, do you just uh, talk to them directly from your next I podcast? I shall on yeah. the next podcast, yes. I'll be discussing it, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it probably tomorrow. And once I get a little more idea of what's going on, I'll, right. I'll certainly tweet and say, it's not going to be available the way you thought it was. It's going to be available in a different way. I'm going to appear in your home as a hologram like Princess <laughs> Leia and warn you of an impending explosion on the Death Star. Yeah. I mean, the truth is, this is a, a horrible experience that you've gone through, and your fans just look forward to seeing the special. I hope so. No, I, I mean, that yeah. if they were ever interested, 
that interest hasn't waned because you've been fucked by a company losing its funding. No, and it wasn't my fault. The company lost its funding, so yeah. I actually had nothing to do with it. Finally, because I picked up the contract and looked at it today, and it has all those force majeure act of God things, in the, and you're like, this was an act of God. <laughs> Show business God. That's right. His mighty thunderbolt was blunted. But Bernie Brillstein has passed away. Yeah, <laughs> right. So who's God now? Yeah. Where's your God now? Um, we have, if you may recall, <laughs> you were on our... I looked up through the research, our 50th, uh, uh, whatever the fuck this is, episode. <laughs> uh, I was going to say broadcast, telecast, none of these things make sense. Sure. Um, although we stream live. Polycast. Show? Polycast. Show. Our 50th show. Yeah. It feels right. Let's put on a show. Live from the rallies on La Brea. <laughs> <laughs> There's a rallies on, on Venice. We drive by it every time. Home we of go, the green thing. Should we go to rallies? Yeah, yeah. We're not going to go to rallies, yeah. are we? Yeah. Are we in Cleveland? How is there a rally? <laughs> right. Live from the Sonic in Riverside. Right. Live from the Shake and Shake in East Lansing, Michigan. <laughs> Greg Proops presents In the Back Room. <laughs> hey. These are where the shamrock shakes are created. That's not a <laughs> seasonal dish. <laughs> Stay away from the mop, kids. Um, so these questions come to you. Were we doing the Tweet 5 when you were on the show last? Anyway, kids, if I remember. Team Probably. Dave Keckner team will take us to it. Team these are rapid fire five okay, questions go. that are designed specifically for you by a fan of yours. In this case, Valentina V from Facebook. Hmm. Um, that was that's a straight up question. That's just a, a straight up question. And then the T five is coming or there. It's, it's it is. right there. Oh, there it is. From, okay. Yeah, uh, from Elric Dieter, Dieter of Sprockets. <laughs> Fame. Oh, Elric Dieter. Okay, from Facebook. T five. Here we go. <laughs> Drew or Aisha. Drew. None of these have correct answers. I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very oblique question. It depends on what use you have for them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the that's the fun slash annoying. Who part. have I held more? Part, Drew. <laughs> part of the game. Drew. I've held Drew more. In green, my hands. green screen show or Drew's improvaganza? Oh, kittens. Green screen. We made a fortune on that tour. Yeah. Improvaganza was. Wildly unsuccessful. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you put an improv show on uh, the Game Show Network, you're, right. you're kind of asking for it. <laughs> I think my favorite moment of Improvaganza was we shot in Las Vegas live at the MGM Grand, and we would bring people out of the audience to do improv. And one night they brought, I think we were doing sound, the hilarious game of sound effects, and they brought a drunk douchebag fuck guy out of the crowd. And you know, you're supposed to go like, you know, bing, bang, whatever, make the noises. And the guy went, woo! to his friends the whole time and we adjourned <laughs> after the show and I had a little word with the cast and I said no one ever bring a 20 something dude with a baseball hat out of the crowd while I'm on stage again ever during my life <laughs> I said I've not spent all this time in this sacred space in the theater worshipping my fucking god for, for this douchebag to come on and yell woo during, <laughs> during a thing I'm doing yeah. I don't go to his house while he's violating women who he's roofied <laughs> and fuck him up so I won't have it on my show. So that was the kind of uncontrollable bullshit that goes on when you do a live show in Vegas. It's like, really? Yeah. Was he violating her, though? Oh, this guy? I don't think that he could have it any other way. I think one day he would not have to pay women, and that would be the day when he, you know, gets a date. Oh, beautiful. You know I, who you were. Yeah. The T5 <laughs> continues with this choice, this Sophie's choice, drunk or high? High. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you take so long? <laughs> Rapping or singing? Singing. Gods or aliens? Gods. Because they don't exist? Uh, because I think there's more than one. <laughs> Hello. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I'm pantheistic. Are you? I am, yes. Please explain. I, I think, well, I think that the idea that one god with a beard played by Anthony Hopkins or Morgan Freeman is great in the movies, mm -hmm. but I think in real life there's a million gods. You know, as you drive around, there's a parking god. Uh, <laughs> when you go to the audition, there's the begging god. When you're gambling, there's the please, please, can I have a nine? You know, there's a lot of different gods, and I think the old, uh, the ancients had it right because you'd have a little, uh, you know, shrine in your house, and you'd have all the little household gods in that shrine, and then you'd go to the field and you'd kill a chicken or whatever, and go, look, please let it happen. And I feel like you still have to appeal to a lot of these entities, a lot of deities. You finally explained a version of uh, the higher power that makes a little bit of sense, because the notion that there was one with the greatest 
Dewey Decibel system known yeah. to man. <laughs> that can be everywhere all the time. <laughs> yeah, what are we talking about yeah. here? It's just instantly, no thank you. Um, so uh, uh, 100,000 little gods is pretty great. I think so. I mean, I want How to do see you see them? How do you see them? How do you see them in your mind's eye? What do they look like, these gods? Oh, you know, some of them are swinging and how they look like Tinkerbell or whatnot, but more violet. Some of them look like the little, uh, really disappointing uh, creatures at the end of the abyss. If you remember, <laughs> there's that water thing that comes in and you're all scared, and then when she drowns in at the end, there's all these like wonderful world of Disney characters that kind of fly around that look like they're from the 60s wonderful world of Disney. Sure. Uh, I think they look like that. Uh, I, 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 I try not to think of the giant you know, Horgoth ones that have the two upturned teeth and the one closed <laughs> bruised eye. And uh, I like to think of them more benign, that they all look like Kate Blanchett in the Lord of the Rings, you know, big elf ears and a weird amulet, you know. That's pretty cool. <laughs> more water, sir? Yes, please. I'd adore more water. And mm. I like your old time bottle. Right? I guess things are originally filled with milk. Um, where will you tour with the uh, new special, or will you? Thank you. I'm always touring, Kevin. Uh -huh. um, I'll be in, uh, uh, let's see, We're, this one's going out today. So if you live in Los Angeles, I'll be showing Eyes Without a Face at the Cine Family on the 30th. Really? Yeah. You ever see Eyes Without a Face? No. It's Tell a French horror film from the late 50s by Georges Franjou, and it's a really poetic and weird, crazy. The guy's a mad doctor. He sends people out. He's, he's, He's been in a car accident with his daughter, who's beautiful, and her face has been ruined. And so now he sends people out every night to Paris to go get young girls so he can extract their face from them and put it on his daughter, but it keeps going wrong over and over and over again. Eyes without a face. Yeah, it's the Holy name of crap. picture. Yeah, my wife picked it out. Uh, I show movies at the Cine Family once a month, and that's a podcast, too. Cine Family is the one on... Fairfax, Fairfax. right near Canners, right. about a block away from Canners. Right. It's in what, what used to be a very Judaica district of L.A. and is now a, the tennis shoe and baseball cap wearing douchebag district for uh, a lot of people. Really? They bypass hipster altogether? They went right from Jew to douche? Well, pretty much. I mean, there's a, uh, like, uh, I don't want to say anything, but I'm guessing a lot of the guys in this room here have been down there to wait in line for tennis shoes. Because <laughs> 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 that's what you see. You see queues of guys in front of tennis shoe stores. Evidently, the newest shoe's important to have. I dig it. Uh, I'm not going to do it myself because I'm a little old for that. I don't want to be the old guy in the line there creeping everybody out and saying, hey, these are some great baseball caps, huh? <laughs> I notice you guys wear them flat. <laughs> that must cut down on the wind resistance when Pharrell comes by and lays some jams on you. <laughs> uh, so uh, I show one there. We showed a lot of goodies. Uh, Dark Afternoon and uh, right. Lifeboat. Last month we showed Sexy Beast. Wow. I try to hit the kids to the job. We showed Annie Hall like three months ago. And on a Monday night, I couldn't sell enough tickets to Annie Hall. And I'm, I'm guessing about three quarters of the crowd had never seen it. And the movie still plays. Yeah. The movie still plays. Oh, yeah. It, it is hilarious. So I love showing 70s movies to people in their 20s because they're like, what were the 70s, Greg? Were there 70 of them? You know, they don't know. Yeah, uh, and where Christopher Walken is this hip icon to them, uh, they see his very first performance in Annie Hall and wonder, really, that's where it started? LV, I... You're an artist, so I... Yeah, he's fantastic <laughs> yeah. at it. And that scene is... So I'm showing that. And then November 6th, I'll be at the Bar Lubitsch uh, here Bar in Los Lubitsch, Angeles right. over on Santa Monica Boulevard and uh, across the street from the Pleasure Chest where sure. it will be Movember. And then... Because uh, this is Cocktober now. <laughs> and then, Pleasure Chest is one of those stores. Let's be clear. And then I'm on the road. Yeah, Calgary, Boston, uh, Brooklyn. Is uh, there a site people can go they to? They can go to gregproops.com. Ignore the giant chill banner that pops up. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't ignore it. Watch it anyway. You'll get an idea of what the, the, the preview is like. Of a very good trailer. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to go to London in uh, December and do a couple dates there. Probably Dublin and Cork as well that week. And then we'll see. Then San Francisco for New Year's. So I'll be at the punchline. Right. Uh, and then next year I'm hoping to do, we're trying to make it happen, like Berlin, Helsinki, Copenhagen, Stockholm, maybe Tallinn, Estonia. Um, yeah. I, this year I did Oslo, Amsterdam, Paris, London, Cork, I mean, uh, Galway, Dublin. I try to take it all around, so... And, and what are you Toronto and whatnot. what are you facing when you go into I mean, I mean I don't want to assume that English is second language everywhere it is but it is huh even in Estonia is my understanding because I've talked to a lot of the comics well the comics who live in London their road is Europe 
right? They do England and Ireland, but then when they do road gigs, they go to like Dubai or Tallinn or Bergen or, or, or Norway. And there's always an English speaking crowd there. Do they pick up every subtle distinction? No. Uh, you can leave them behind in the dirt if you go fast enough. Right. Uh, but I try to talk about where I am and what's going on there. Like we did one in Oslo, and my wife and I went to the Munch Museum. And you know, Munch's famous for the scream, right? Which is the most abject depiction of terror and despair in the face of modernity, you know, in, in the history of art. It's the, you know, so there's a Munch museum and it's got the scream and evidently Munch really liked to have a drink. There's one painting of him that he did of himself called Munch with bottles and there's just <laughs> bottles everywhere. And then I pick up the guidebook and, and of course they sell Munch, uh, they sell scream uh, erasers, scream bicycle reflectors, scream everything, pencils, mm. hilarious. Scream condoms, my favorite. I mean, of, of all the things you want to see around you all the time, it's the I can't handle the world anymore moment. Right. Uh, they had Munch for children on the weekends, and of course I'm crying at this point. So I thought, <laughs> so like, who want, you want to understand this, the Scandinavian viewpoint? The, the, the Jews have nothing on the Scandinavians as far as that the world is going to end horribly and probably sooner. Right. Uh, so uh, I, I try to talk about where I am and stuff. Uh, Amsterdam was, that one went on a little bit. It was a little fuzzy. Uh, I was a little high the second half of the show. And, uh, where are you? Yeah, and then... Uh, second half because of the contact buzz? Mm, we weren't smoking inside. We all went outside and adjourned. I just did one in Toronto at a place called The Underground. And... It's not a dispensary, they sell edibles, but you're allowed to smoke dope inside. Don't ask me the legalities of how Canada works. So I walked into this place and it had about 100 people in it. And they were already smoking. Every single table had uh, dishes and scissors in the whole enchilada. Um, it was three hours of, all you could see were burning cherries, right, in the crowd. <laughs> and I smoked maybe half a joint, and I'm a pretty experienced pot smoker. I don't get too high after half a joint. After an hour and a half during this podcast, I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> This next topic features daisies. You know, like it just slowed down. And I could feel the crowd had slowed down to nothing, too. I was having to completely hand Have you heard that one back? Uh, no. <laughs> no. And I know the question portion was just all over the fucking yard. Right. Uh, I take questions from the crowd at the end. And a lot of, we've turned, one thing that's been a running through line is, Baseball teams. It started with someone said, give me your all-time Roman emperor baseball team. So I was like, okay, Julius Caesar's the manager. I got Tiberius at first for the, you know, and give reasons for everybody. And I said, Caligula behind the plate because he can handle balls. <laughs> and uh, um, then every week and now. Nothing's getting past him. Yeah, it seems, it seems like someone does a new one. So in Amsterdam, someone said that, like your baseball team of novelists. So I'm high, and I'm like, uh, fuck, fuck, Faulkner's a novelist? Uh, uh, Poe, did he write a novel? You know? And I get to the end, and I have nothing. And a guy in the front row who was very sober in Amsterdam, and, and a lot older, a, a real studious type, he had the ascetic beard and the little glasses, he looked like Trotsky. Mm. He goes, Boccaccio. Definitively, and I went, perfect! <laughs> Boccaccio's it, whoever writes the Decameron is the fucking leader on my team, good night everybody. And I was like, oh thank God you were there to close this fuck around. I wouldn't have been able to pull Boccaccio out of a bag of assholes. It would have been, <laughs> would have been a team made up completely of Stephen King. Yeah, oh right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael Connolly at first, uh, Dick, Dick Francis, right. Robert Ludlum. Oh, Robert Cray, you gotta put it... Uh, uh, left, so left field. Yeah. I think. Oh, and then, then people write me. How come you left Hunter Thompson? You know, but that, but that's what every, that's what everything is. Everything's a discussion. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I like. It's an ongoing thing. And I, every time I make mistakes, which I do in every episode, I read them back on the air. I read the people who write me, and then they correct me. And like I mentioned, Klaus Van Bulo, because I, I'm always doing Jeremy Irons. He's my one impression, and. Uh, I mentioned Klaus Van Bulo, and I said he was German, and a guy wrote me and went, I don't mean to be a dick, but he's Danish. It was like he was born in Denver, you know, so I looked it up, of right. course, and then I had to address the whole where is Klaus von Bulow from issue that's burning in people's minds. <laughs> is it still, by the way, is that still an allowed qualifier, I don't mean to be a dick? Because it's never followed with someone not being a dick. It, exactly. It's like when people say, I don't mean to be critical, but you're too short. You know what I mean? Like, what? <laughs> it's always that way. Yeah. No, it, no, it isn't an allowed qualifier. Because yeah. you're always going to be a dick. If you weren't going to be a dick, you would have just said, by the way, Klaus von Bulow's from Denmark. Yeah. And do you get any points for the qualifier? Because a real douchebag with the baseball cap who comes on a stage and goes, woo, yeah. would never say, 
Or would he? I don't mean to rape you, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, he wouldn't. He would just have a tattoo on his forehead that alerted you <laughs> yeah. to some sort of mayhem was about to take place. Um, are you still enjoying the Twitter? <laughs> the Twitter? Uh, yeah, I, I am. I try to mix it up and not... Uh, you know, we lean heavily on plugging everything we're doing because yeah. it's the way we do now. Right. So, you know, you try to throw a joke in now and again. But I can't just do one-liner dick jokes every day because it's not me. I take a year to tell one fucking story. So Twitter's not exactly the perfect medium for... Right. If it was called loquacious instead of Twitter <laughs> and you had a thousand characters, then I, every day I could fill a short story. Uh, but yeah, I do. And so I find that... If I put something up political, like about women's reproductive rights or something that I care about, I get two or three retweets and a favorite. If I put pancakes and have a picture of a pancake, I get a thousand retweets, <laughs> seven million favorites. Everybody loves it. So food is really a big winner, right? I think. Well, there's something that has also uh, begun on this show since you were here at our 50th episode, and that is a game we like to call Who Tweeted? Okay. There it is. <laughs> uh, we got a little graphic. I love it. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Hi, Sam. Gonna, hey, Greg. Gonna I'm going to join you. Join us. Oh, this is exciting. Sammy Levine hosting gonna, yet another episode of Who Tweeted, everybody? Oh, Sammy, is, this explain is tremendous. the game to our guests, With please. pleasure. So Who Tweeted is a little game that you're going to play against Kevin that I'll be hosting. Okay. Okay, here's how the game works. One at a time, I'm... What do you want to do after? Oh, I'm sorry. Was just, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> so one at a time, I'm going to read a series of eight tweets. Each of these tweets was authored by either Tyra Banks, Paris Hilton or Justin Bieber. Mm. I'm sure they all dine at Musso and Frank's together. So, uh, well, when I begin... their food there. <laughs> when I begin reading the tweet, at any time yeah. you feel that you know who authored it, you bring in by saying your own name, either Greg or Kevin, and then I'll point to you, you'll have three seconds to say either Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. Okay. You ring in, you get it right, you get yourself five points. Ring in, you get it wrong, you're gonna lose three. At There's the, a penalty for incorrect. At the end of eight tweets, whoever is in the lead, is going to be the proud owner of this. Cash prize, everybody, cash wow. prize! Wow! Cash, cash prize! Our seventh and sexiest president. <laughs> <laughs> Look at his hair. <laughs> his hair is his, insane. His hair is the greatest. Truly I, luxurious. Of everyone That's on the bills, nice. Andrew Jackson's hair is the greatest. And if you go through and look him up on Google's uh, or whatever search engine you use, his hair's outstanding through his whole career. That's why he got all the black chicks. Yeah, oh yeah. Because of that hair. It's yeah. like Chris Walken hair. And talk about not meaning to be a dick. When your nickname's Old Hickory, and that, they didn't give him that name because he was nice. <laughs> Hello. The last uh, president to fight in the revolution. He was a teenage captive of the British, ergo his intense hatred of the English. No kidding. Throughout his whole life. He, when he was 17, he was tortured and captured by the English during the revolution. And then he went on to be president 30 years later. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I got lots of Andy. Talk yeah. about qualifiers. Sorry, uh, Andy, <laughs> we're going to stick bamboo in your testicles. Yeah. I hope that's all right. Now, I don't mean to be a hick. <laughs> <laughs> but all y'all tried to burn the White House down. <laughs> and I ain't having it. Yeah, or the gold standard. And fuck you, James Knox, Polk. That's how he talked. <laughs> he had country music hair. Yeah. He has really got like a Johnny Cash Porter Wagner. Yeah. You know, which is just bitching in the 1820s. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> wow. Sammy? I'm fascinated. Too intimidated to continue? <laughs> Sir, fuck the game. I want to hear more about Andy J. All right, let's get through the game. So All right. Can do Are you ready to play? I am. Who so. tweeted? Tyra, <laughs> Paris, Bieber. Tweet number one. If you can't laugh at yourself, you are missing out on a lot of laughs. Mm, Don't Greg. be so serious. I'm going to say uh, Tyra, because she's got a lot of wisdom. Uh, normally, that might be correct, but unfortunately, shockingly, that was somehow Justin Bieber. Wow! Yeah, but it, but it must have been originally written a rare by moment. Tyra. A rare and then moment. Bieber. Well, I didn't yeah. think he was capable of that amount of self awareness. Nor uh, did I. All right. Tweet okay. number two. Tweet number two. Still early. Very early. So you know when you're really tired. So you lay down to take a nap, <laughs> but you can't put down your phone. <laughs> Kevin Paris. It is tied at negative three. Wow. That, <laughs> that was Ms. Tyra Banks. Oh. That one started with you know when you're so you know when you're so really you know tired. You're really so tired. you lay down and take a nap, but can't put down your phone. There's no punctuation. understand she's wealthy and is a huge producer. There's no <laughs> punctuation anywhere in that tweet. Wow. Tweet number three. 
pulling up to the Today Show. About to do a live interview with them. Tune in now to watch. Who writes that? I, I don't know. <laughs> it's so douchey, it's unbelievable. Uh, Greg Bieber? No, it's oh. in Paris. It's Paris. Paris. It had to be Paris. <laughs> so right. damn it. It's so okay. vapid, though. Don't, it could be. Oh, don't it worry. Could be. My intuition failed me. It's don't know. It's fine. It's just a, it's a close game in the negative. We're Street being very four. consistent. We'll get one of these right, I'm sure. Sometimes you gotta face the big bad wolf. Kevin Bieber. Or Camel. Kevin Bieber. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, that wasn't Bieber? <laughs> nope. Who faces the big bad wolf? Or Camel. Tyra Banks. Tyra How does that make Banks. it more clear that it's Tyra? Oh, these, these are hard. These are hard. Or Camel? What a tough game. What the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> Tweet <laughs> number five. So you know the when you were singing. Oh, no, go. <laughs> so you know when you were singing and feel you sound even better than artist you're singing to, but no one in room with you says you sound good. No one in room? I read these exactly as they are written. No one in room? Oh no God. one in room Why are they speaking cave you? English? <laughs> Surely there's articles now. Kevin Paris. Please say it's Paris. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Tyra Banks. Five. When did she even, sing? Even statistically, one of you should have gotten one <laughs> accidentally correct at this point. No, that's not true. Five. There's a 30% chance for I each of us so. on every single one. It's all Five. right. That was Miss Tyra <laughs> Banks. Tyra when did she Banks. sing? We are and how come she doesn't have any articles in her I know. Tweets? I thought I was being creative saying Paris because yeah. she sings on occasion. Yeah. It's all right. She didn't even sing me. in Coyote Ugly. She just danced a little. She just danced a little. Yeah. yeah, no, she's not good at it, evidently. Oh, for five, here comes question tweet, number tweet six. Tweet number six. Expect the unexpected. Oh, God. Uh, Greg, <laughs> Justin. That is correct! Yes! Hallelujah! Brothers we, and sisters! We have... We have a powerhouse. A correct answer. I'm a proof believer. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. Yeah, Good one, Justin. That is deep. Is that it, by the way? Expect the unexpected? Deep. Was that the beginning and the whole of the tweet? That is it. How many followers does he have? About 5 million? Oh, uh, he's in Almost the 20s. 20 million. Oh, 20 yeah. million. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there's a lot of children. Most, most of them are Thai. Tweet number seven. Most of them are Thai. Watching Saturday Night Live. I love this show. Look forward to seeing Katy Perry's performance. Kevin Paris. That is correct. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I just kept saying Kevin Perry. Yeah. Well, this is exciting now so because finally we have a, a three-point game. You have to ask yourself, who would be looking forward to Katy Perry's performance on SNL? Who is we, making that appointment viewing? We've got ourselves a three-point game heading into the eighth and possibly final And tweet. by that we mean negative four, negative one. That is correct. I wasn't going <laughs> to point it out. I was just getting a discrepancy say, in scores. No one's up on the, uh, the, the high side. It's all that was important to me. Okay. Tweet number eight. Yes. Number eight, number eight, number eight, number eight. Now, if Kevin rings in and gets this wrong, we're going to have ourselves a tie. That's all I'm saying. What? Have you read it yet? Nope. Oh. You mean get this. Here it is. Right. Here it is. Shopping in Asia. Hashtag the best. Kevin Bieber. Fortunately, that somehow is correct. Wow. Making our winner nice. in a startling come from behind win. <laughs> Plus Mr. one to negative Kevin one. We Pollack. stink. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. My pleasure, Kevin. What that is how you play. Thanks, Mr. Levine. Put that back. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played? Who's I the can't black -haired see him. Person? Oh, originally it was uh, <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to fix the graphic. We got to fix. Originally it was uh, Paris, Tyra, or Demi. Oh, it is Demi. Yeah. Um, uh, general fascination of uh, uh, American presidential history, or where? What? what uh, how? How narrow is the? Uh, oh no, it's just search it, and knowledge. It was just that I, I grew my hair out a little uh, a couple years ago for a while, and uh, the only person I could think of that. The hair that I wanted was Andrew Jackson. So yeah. you looked him up, and now you know everything about him. Well, kind of. There was that biography, but I didn't read it. Uh, I prefer to. I prefer to get my information piecemeal through third-party sources. Sure, of course. No, I usually read more ancient history and medieval history and stuff than American presidents. What kind of student were you? Because I, I was so fucking bored to tears. Yeah, indifferent. Yeah. 
I've, everything I've learned, uh, except for one or two teachers, and you know you remember the two teachers that made you ever like Mr. Anything. Shimani, yeah. who well, you would get a test, and it said preheat oven at 350. These are the instructions yeah. for the test. Just fantastic. Also banging one of the, uh, one of the seniors. As you do. Yeah. And uh, yes, my minister did that in high school. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Oh, no, nice. We a little youth group. Uh, and then the other teacher was uh, American Lit, where I discovered Sam L. Clemens. Oh, I fantastic. Lost, lost my mind in social satire. Yeah. yeah. No, I had Mr. Haggard. He was, he was delightful. No, I've, I've read it all on my own, mostly. Uh, right now I'm reading a book about uh, Leonardo and the Last Supper. It's just f fantastically interesting. Uh, because of the minutiae in it, like he wrote lists of everything, and he wasn't very good at math, which made me happier than anything I've ever read. Really? Uh, he, geometry, obviously, he's a, a past genius of because his perspective and his visual acuity is unsurpassed. He couldn't add, really, not that well. Wow. And uh, that made me happy. And that he wrote grocery lists and stuff, so they have on the back of those beautiful notebooks, it'll say, like, rice, got some corn the other day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, buy some stockings, right. got wine for everybody. Right. Yeah, there's one that got, got wine for the morning. That was my favorite one. Wow. For the morning. <laughs> for the morning. Oh, yeah, Leonardo. Yeah. Evidently, a gay as a hat with a finch on it, and just <laughs> uh, beautiful, could play, could sing, and, and spent a lot of time designing sets and stuff. And shot at the original uh, Trader Joseph's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, was a chef, you say? Uh, uh, did did um uh, he was a, a, a strict vegetarian from all, all account, uh, accounts, wow. but uh, did a lot of set design and stage design for oh. all the giant things they put on in court. And uh, he also, you know, obviously designed uh, architecture canals and war machines and this and that. But they really employed him because he was fabulous at doing set design to make all these giant sets that would open up and there'd be things inside and water would pour and lightning and people would fly through and. Like, he was just great at that. All those are kind of gone. They don't have sketches of that. So we have all the scientific things and the right. anatomy. And uh, He is the original re Renaissance person, right? He, he's got it on in every medium and was bright as the Dickens. Right. And evidently really nice. Really? Yeah. Not, not a tempestuous, not like Michelangelo, who disliked Leonardo intensely, uh, a, lot, a little younger than Leonardo. Leonardo said something to him once about his medium or whatever, and Michelangelo's answer was, Bafungu, you know, and like, but Michelangelo loved sculpture, and they made him paint the Sistine Chapel. And Leonardo thought painting was the living end, so I think they disagreed aesthetically. Right. But damn, there you are. And I read something interesting about Michelangelo this year, which was he was buried in his boots and his outfit as if he was going to work. It would be like putting me in a suit and tie, and you know, like yeah. <laughs> with a mic in my hand, you know. And this is by choice, as you Oh, know. yeah, yeah, I know. He lived to be quite old. Michelangelo lived to be, like, in his late 80s or something. Outlived every pope he worked for. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, in yeah. those times, especially, that age was uh, beyond remarkable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Leonardo book's fascinating. It's called Leonardo and the Last Supper. Uh, but I like to read a lot. We're on planes a lot, so we have the advantage of being able to Do you like the actual physical? I do. I have a Kindle, but I, I like the genuine article. Yeah because I like to go back and forth and look at stuff. And I, I uh, had my first book come out this year, the uh, Softback, <laughs> came out uh, just recently. Congratulations. Uh, called How I Slept My Way to the Middle. <laughs> and of all the things I have sold after the show, starting with pot back in the 70s, right. and then CDs, and then That's DVDs. Okay. You skipped cassettes, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> out of respect. Yeah. Um, a physical book, a signing of a physical book as something to meet people after the show and, and, and sell it, to, uh, it is, uh, I have to say, 10 to 1 minimum, at, at most conservative. It just blew my mind. Yeah. I thought, this is a horrible idea. You know, <laughs> they would prefer a t-shirt that right. says, go fuck yourself, right. right? No, they want to, and I don't even know that they read it. I think it just goes on the shelf and that's a signed copy of the thing. Very bizarre. It's not important sometimes whether they read it, but like you say, there's a kind of immortality in books, right? Because of the physical. Yeah. They're defined things, and they don't, unless it's just awful and you end up using it to keep the t wonky table leg from, you know, <laughs> you know, it is a memento. Yeah. I have a signed book from Jonathan Winters. I have a signed book from George Carlin. I have a signed book from Steve Allen. Yeah. And I keep them very dear, right next to my desk, all those books, because I love those people, and I love, you know. Yeah. So I 
presume that they feel the same way about you when they get your book and you inscribe it? Well, there's, there is a conversation that takes place yeah. in the connection that you're making, which is obviously the, the part of the process now. Um, uh, let me ask you about, um, oh, but there was another Facebook question. That I, just, okay. I, I definitely want to make sure that the audience watching was allowed into, oh, another, t another tweet five. Look, everyone, it's another tweet five. Oh, hey. Giving them time to cue the various. Uh, this one from at Clay Foy or CL Foy. There's a lot of capitals and non capital, I'm confused. Uh -huh. uh, page or Bell? P page or Bow? Bell. Page or Bell. I don't know what that means. Excellent. Kittens McTavish or ah. Jeremy Irons? <laughs> Jeremy Irons. <laughs> Colin or Ryan? Uh, that's a Sophie's choice. At choices. the same time. <laughs> Ooh. Texas or Carolina style? Oh, Carolina. Pitching or hitting? Hitting. Really? Yeah. That's surprising. Yeah. I guess I couldn't. I was a terrible hitter. But as a fan, you must agree that pitching wins, will win the World Series again this year. Pitching is definitive. There's no way to win it without pitching. And uh, the, our, our beloved team, who won the World Series last year, proved that twice in the two series we went to. Because our lineup was sporadic, but <laughs> we had guys we could run up there every day. Pitching always wins. Pitching in D. Uh, what was Earl Weaver's uh, maxim? Pitching D and three-run cock-sucking homers. <laughs> oh, that's pretty great. Um, oh, here it is. It's just that I like hitting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I want to see someone drive that ball. Valentina V from Facebook. Now that whose line is back... Would you like to be a regular again? I expect I might be on it. However, considering what happened to me this week in show business, uh, I'd rather not venture that that's a certainty. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be on the next series, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Let's just. The, the many gods yeah. are going to discuss. Yes, there'll be lots of things. So uh, I, ex I suspect I will. Let's put it that way. Um, okay. Now, there was something here. Because you are first repeat guest. Um, and it's a no repeat, you know, year. And it is clearly a no repeat year. I went through the old questions from, oh. from your last visit. Well then. And I discovered there were a few things we might not have gotten to. Um, <laughs> brace yourself. Um, I remember we talked about your performing for the troops in Bosnia, Kosovo, Kosovo and uh, the Persian Gulf. What a lucky time for those troops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be in the middle of that mayhem and have me lift the light. <laughs> Just think about it. Yeah, so I, I'm curious with the time we spend with the audience after the show these days, or in your case of the podcast mm. before the show, that's the part of uh, this experience uh, performing for people that I've, I've yet to experience. So and I'm curious, because the obvious assumption is they smother you and thank you, and all you want to say is thank you for your service. So how does it go beyond that? What, what is that experience like? Oh, you meet everyone when you play for the troops, and it's right. really fantastic. They put you at a table, and I was with Drew all the times so we did this. We did improv for them. Uh, haven't they suffered enough, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> some, of them been held, something funny. some of them have been held captive. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then, so they put us all at a table, and then they come through, and we talk to every single one and shake hands with all of them. And um, the troops of this modern army are not like Bilko's platoon. There's nobody who looks like Doberman, you know? There's, <laughs> you saw, you know, you know, there's, uh, there's no Arnold Stang in the outfit. Uh, every, they're giant, and they shake your hand, and they crush it. And I came home from one... A, like USO tour with basically a kind of a broken hand, you know, from because they just and so they, they taught us to shake hands, but you stick your forefinger out like that and make sure it's stiff, and that way, hopefully, they don't break these small because they're just excited metacarpal bones. And yeah. when you have that many muscles, then yeah. you're excited. To I would flirt shamelessly with all of the troops and just you know, come here, baby, and, yeah. you know, get on my lap, you know, and like that. And, <laughs> Uh, that way it obviates you having to weep over them every two seconds and stuff like that. Right. The funnest one we ever did, uh, I'll tell a funny story about myself and how great I am. We were playing in um, uh, Kosovo on Thanksgiving Day and um, for the Big Red One, which is a storied unit in the army, right? They were, uh, there's a famous, uh, well, there's a film by Terrence Malick about them and whatnot, but uh, they're a famous unit. They were in a lot of big engagements. World War I, they were in the Civil War, blah, blah, blah. And they're rough and tough. 
you know, they're a rough and tough unit. I mean, it's a lot of guys, and they. So we had um, Caitlin Olson with us, who's on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Love her. And uh, so they were pretty excited to, that there was a girl on the premises, right? Because sure. we were in Kosovo, and it was not fun. They and forgave her for being funny? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she has a vagina? Right. It's yeah. fine. She, right. She, 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 she was oviparous, and she was alive. <laughs> and uh, so they, uh, the, the show went okay. I don't actually think they understood what we were doing at any point. You know, like, improv didn't. I, they did the concept, never kind of got. Also, Drew's explanations of games are at best opaque. You know, like, he, <laughs> Drew, Drew's, <laughs> Drew gets some, I mean, uh, uh, this one, uh, sound effects, uh, okay, well, let me go. You know, and you're like, I, I didn't, I, I didn't actually understand what you said. <laughs> and uh, so we do the show, and I remember we were doing some bit about the army, and guys are screaming out, you're doing it wrong! Like, you know, like, <laughs> like technical shit that only an army person would know. Like, you know, like, okay, well, I don't know how fucking, you know. So we finish, and the commander that comes up, and he was a colonel, and he was from Mississippi, and he oh. had a straight up Mississippi. And my mother's from Mississippi, right? Like, he... You know, he spoke like this, right? And he had to read our names out, and they gave us little uh, uh, plaques and whatnot. So he goes, Drew Carey, uh, we want to thank y'all and all your comedian friends for coming up here and doing this comedy for us. He gets to my name, and he, he's never seen it. He doesn't know who I am. And he goes, Greg, Greg. How do you say your name? And I said, you're the commander. Why don't you fucking tell me? And the place, ex <laughs> the big red one, fucking, whoa! Like, I couldn't, I, and he, I don't know if you remember the scene in Patton where he calls the Russian a son of a bitch, and the look, <laughs> the look that the Russian gives him. <laughs> that colonel stood there like this, looking at me, and he had to... You know, because the boys were fucking happy. Yeah. The boys were happy. And he literally did want to carve you in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hats in the air, man. I mean, it was fucking, <laughs> wow! Guys were fucking pounding the table because I just sassed his ass off. And he handed me the plaque. And I went, thank you, Colonel. <laughs> yeah. And he moved on to the next. Caitlin Olson, you know, and I was like, <laughs> I, the only reason I lived through that was because the troops were happy and he had to be a mensch about it. Right. He had to. <laughs> wow. No other time. And people came up to me afterward and went like, you know, because there would be colonels and stuff and we had a captain with us and we go, could you tell that fucking colonel to get off the stage or whatever? He go, no, <laughs> I am a captain. They are a colonel. You don't tell them yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in every form of no, I mean. No. Mm. <laughs> you know, you'd be standing there in the morning and like a rebel would play or a colonel, you'd be having conversation with officers and a higher officer would walk by and they all, you know, while you're talking and you, oh, you know, do I salute? I'm, do I have to? I'm a civilian, you know. Yeah. So that was a pretty fun one. Yeah. Pretty, pretty <laughs> I was good. glad I sassed off, but uh, it was... Thank God there was a thousand troops in the room. It's amazing how you. your comedic instinct knows that's going to work. Because if you deconstruct it and you sit down, you have a moment ahead of time to rehearse your ad libs, and you say, "Should I take a shot at the?" Because you Ooh. know the old standard for me. Anytime you do a corporate gig, and I think Dennis Miller might have been the first one I saw do this, and I, you know he got it from fifty before him. Yeah. The standard line is whatever president, CEO of the company introduces the talent at the corporate retreat for which you're being overpaid and underappreciated, because um, they were told to go to see uh -huh. you that night. You uh -huh. got the seminar during the day. Right. We've been doing breakouts for three days. <laughs> That's right. You're going to go see the comedian tonight. Um, the CEO inter introduce you horribly, yeah. and then you walk up and say, thank you, uh, Mr. Davis, for whipping them into a frenzy. And they go apeshit yeah. crazy because yeah. he was horrible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so th the instinct in your mind just said, in that nanosecond, you could have easily just pronounced your yeah, name proofs. for him and moved on. Yeah. No. Why not. don't you tell me? Yeah, you're the colonel. Colonel? Yeah. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> you're fucking in charge. Uh-huh. Holy crap. Oh, my God, the place. Yeah, I was glad I did it. But, again, I was, even as I said it, my heart was racing. <laughs> and then when he looked at me, I was like, you know. <laughs> yeah. You and me, buddy. I, uh, you and me, we made this moment. And he... <laughs> You know. They foolishly allowed me to host the uh, Independent Spirit Awards one year. Uh, it must have been in the 90s when I had a film career. <laughs> um, and I love the 90s. I had a TV career then. It was awesome. <laughs> and Harvey Keitel was getting the, uh, he was one of the big muckety-mucks yeah. that, that year. 
and uh, Bad Lieutenant and Piano. Oh yeah. Have both come out. Uh, both God. in which both his penis appears. Yes. Uh, magically and uh, for quite some time. So I, in introducing him, said, um, our uh, uh, person of honor th th this afternoon um, is uh, recently showing such brilliant work in piano and um, bad lieutenant. In fact, his penis has separate representation. <laughs> the place laughed huge, and he, please welcome Harvey Keitel. And he walked towards me. And I'm still convinced when I remember it that he was going to kill me. Yeah. That's how he was a Marine. That's how crystal clear he was in his eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he walked towards me and the mic was way over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he did this towards yeah. the mic. And he wanted me to shit myself. Yeah. And he succeeded. I was going to say, and you did. Yeah, 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 I did. Oh, because he's uh, terrifying. Yeah. He's Harvey Cattell. And humorless, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But clearly, one of the greatest performances in a, a Scorsese film would be him in Last Temptation of Christ, let's be honest. Uh, That's the Brooklyn. Yeah, I was going to say, all of a sudden, it's a little different. That was funny. Hey, Jesus, what the hell yeah, over yeah. here with this? Oh, oh, that's going to hurt. Nice, oh. nice tits. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that, he's so great in The Bad Lieutenant. God, that movie's good. We saw, yeah, yeah. Uh, we saw it in uh, uh, Paris, my wife and I, and nothing but French people in the theater, and it had French subtitles. And we're laughing, like when he shoots the radio, there's some scenes in it that are outrageous. What are you, a drug counselor? He's fucking doing coke and shit. And the French crowd... Mm. Like they thought it was like a documentary, and the more serious they got about it, the more my wife and I were laughing. They must have thought we were the sickest fuckers that ever lived, you know. Like, well, you were. Yeah. That point aside, um, we are simply out of time, sir. You have places to be. I do. Yeah, we have schedules and time and commitments. Um, I want to thank. I've got you. contracts to break. <laughs> yeah, and kneecaps. Um, <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thank you for having me on, Kevin. Yeah. I'm so excited that I'm the first repeat uh, customer. 186. I love it. Yeah. Thank you very much. We were thrilled to uh, thank you to help announce your new stand-up comedy special, <laughs> which people can find soon. Yeah. Yes, they will. The name of it? Live at Musso and Frank. Genius. Yeah. All right. Keeping it simple. Sit there uncomfortably, if you would, please, while I wrap things up for uh, the fine folks. I'd be chuffed. Around the world, uh, here as we are wide. Web, Sammy. Yes. Uh, we'll see you and Lynn Levine next Sunday. Next Sunday. Don't miss it. Could not be more excited. You and me both. Yeah. Tune in, folks. Write to us at contact at Let yeah, us know. Maybe you, people have some questions for you Lynn. Watch live. Yeah. If you have any questions for Lynn, yeah. submit them this week. Send, About send, Sammy's up. Call her Ryan. We'll get to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Write to contact at <laughs> and let us know your questions for Lynn Levine. Yep. Please. <laughs> I want to thank Samantha Ward, who uh, uh, helped uh, Greg and I look uh, slightly younger by six months, <laughs> uh, which at our age still makes a difference. Oh, God. Really I'll take does. anything. <laughs> I'm going to perform behind a curtain, I think, in the future. <laughs> Just a sheer drape. You know what I mean? Oh Pay God, some attention to the man behind the yeah, curtain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay slight attention. <laughs> Um, I'm going to wear a mask like in the movie A Star is Born or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Danielle, our new media maven, again, still crushing it. Uh, two weeks in, I, she's a keeper. I agree. Uh, Dr. Chan here in the studio and the wonderful Ryan Eaton helping out. Uh, and our everyone's award-winning uh, intern, uh, David, um, returned. I think I probably mentioned on the show before that uh, his, his pops and I met at Temple. Oh. In San Jose, California. Doesn't that just sound like an odd... The Rosicrucian Temple? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the one across the street. <laughs> How do you know that? That's crazy. Temple Manuel, technically. I'm from, I'm from the Bay Area. Ah, uh, well, that's still impressive. Mandel, David Mandel, the family name. Um, <laughs> that's the whole time that's what you're coming up with? No. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that Brad, his father, got the shot. I see. Shout out. Uh, Josh and uh, Jason, I believe, the two J's of, of non-Jews. Uh, quarter Jew, I think, Josh. At one really? Point. He, he could have gone with quarter Cherokee. I'm dubious. And he went quarter Jew. I'm mm. right. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, who am I forgetting? Anybody? Nobody. All right. Next week, Academy Award winner number eight, Jim Rash. You love him on Community as an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote uh, with his partner Descendants, and now I think they also directed the. Way they way wrote way and back. directed way way back. Wrote, yeah. wrote and uh, directed, which I think may squeak into the top ten now, because the Academy Award nomination for Best Picture is ten. I hope the way way back gets its uh, its just due, and we just did the live read with Jason Reitman that he was at for uh, Boogie Nights. Yeah, he played the um, Cheadle. He played read the Don Cheadle role, which mm -hmm. is pretty fucking spectacular. Yes. With the right amount of 
uh, on the fence. Uh, is he doing a slightly enjoyable uh, racist black voice, or is he doing <laughs> it's great. Uh, a brilliant interpretation? Was Nothing better than the Ocean's Eleven English character, because oh, that one is. Yeah. He was also the cool, blimey. Movie. Yeah, Don Cheadle's British. Mary actor. Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> chim chim chiroo, mateys. <laughs> yeah. And what a brilliant actor yeah. who just came up snake eyes <laughs> on that role in Vegas. Um, all right, join us next week. Until then, and as always, get out of my face. Huh?